Can I get the sound? Good morning and welcome to the Church in the Gardens on this fifth Sunday of Easter and also Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to mothers, stepmothers, mothers-in-law, grandmothers, um, aunts and friends who are like mothers, and of course, mothers that are already in heaven. Please pray for Jackie Russell for her brother Eugene, who is hospitalized and intubated. Um, here's the message from the search committee. We had everybody try to postmark by May 6th, but some people were having a little trouble with their postal service. So we're letting it go another week. You will receive the uh, tally, the official results next Sunday, May 17th. Uh, just a reminder that the Zoom Bible study is still going on, and you can sign up for the mailing list to find out the date, the time, the topics, and the entry password by contacting Janet Fry at the address posted. The Care Committee posts an ongoing message for everyone, anyone who can help volunteer with them to help our congregants that need help, contact the Care Committee, and any congregants out there that need help please contact the care committee members that are listed there. For the annual meeting announcement, we will have a trustee do this and it's Janet Fry today. Here's Janet. Unmute Janet. I got it. I got it. Good morning, everyone. And the trustees want to remind you that next week, May 17th is the big meeting of the year. And due to the pandemic and the governor's shelter at home order, we will gather as a congregation via Zoom. Um, it'll be at 11.15 following our service. Um, one of the most important things we'll be uh, discussing and doing is the election of our church leaders. Prior to the meeting, you should all receive a letter by mail, including the annual report, the budget, the officiary, and a ballot for voting for church officials and members of the church's boards and committees. Members are expected to mail your completed ballots back to the church where they will be tallied. We welcome all congregants to attend, although according to the bylaws, only the members of the church are eligible to vote. We look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you. 
Thank you, Janet. And next, we're going to hear a stewardship committee report from Alan Maurer. Good morning. I'm here to report on the final results of the stewardship campaign. Again, we do live in times of personal, national, and worldwide stress. But our church is growing in strength and spirit, and shortly we should have a new minister. The results of the stewardship drive reflect this new spirit. Together, we've received pledges totaling more than 109,000, with hopefully more coming in. Though we live in difficult times, we have exceeded last year's numbers. When we stand together, we do accomplish more than we can on our own. But if you haven't sent your pledge in, please send it now. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. A reminder from the transformation team that silent prayer and meditation is still taking place online every Tuesday from 7 to 7.30 p.m. throughout the period of social distancing. You're welcome to join for a few minutes or the full half hour for renewal and reflection. Any questions, contact Cindy Herendine at the email address she's provided or her phone number. And today we're blessed to welcome our Reverend, our dear friend and our uh, Reverend for this week and also next week, Beth Perry. Well, it's good to be here with you. Um, let us join in prayer. Most gracious God, we thank you that you have called us to be your house, built on the strong foundation of a precious cornerstone. You have called us, <clears throat> excuse me, to be living stones, built up into a holy people doing acceptable acts in your name. We come today to you seeking refuge and rescue, but you turn us into a fortress for others. We come to you seeking guidance and knowledge, but you turn us into light for others. We come to you seeking deliverance, but you turn us into imitators of your mighty acts of deliverance. Hear our voices in this hour as we proclaim your glory in words and song, in prayer and in praise. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. I will read the one and you will read the many. Come to the living stone, rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. See, I am laying in Zion a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes will not be put to shame. Like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are a royal priesthood, a holy house, God's own people. So that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you into marvelous light. Good morning, everyone. Let us join together in song, singing How Firm a Foundation. You'll notice this, this tune is very familiar, although um, these words might be less so. Yeah. 
Please join me now in the prayer of confession. Holy God, faithful and true, you gather us together once again to celebrate life in your presence, to give thanks for your abundance and love. And yet even as we gather, we recognize that at times we have failed to live as your children. In thoughts, words, and deeds, we have not sought the ways of love and justice. By the things we have not done, by the things we have done, and by things that we have left undone, we have turned in on ourselves, allowing fear to make us small. And so we turn to you, confessing our sins and seeking pardon, peace, and forgiveness. Know that for all we have done and all we have left undone, we are forgiven. Let us share the signs of peace with each other as a sign of that reconciliation and as a commitment to work ever towards love and justice in the world. As we repeat the words of the peace, I invite you to maybe reach out and touch your finger to your camera, a way we can become closer to each other. And uh, perhaps we could open up the, the um, uh, video so we can see everyone as we do this. Um, and then maybe even just a, a peace sign or something to, uh, to share peace with each other. Um, would you like to cancel the spotlight on me right now? Thank you. So the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. And also with you. Listen for the word of the Lord from Psalm 31, verses 1 through 5, and also 15 and 16. In you, O Lord, I seek refuge. Do not let me ever be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. You are indeed my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that is hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. And the gospel reading is from John chapter 14. Verses 1 through 14, listen for the word of the Lord. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. 
if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you also may be. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of the Lord. So this uh, week, I am in the middle of preaching for three weeks in a row, and I've been having the same reaction to each Sunday's scriptures. There is something in these very familiar verses that I have been missing in all my previous readings. This week in this gospel reading, it's that last sentence. It's Jesus' statement that, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. Now, I think that I've preached on those verses, on that particular verse, probably 40 times uh, between, you know, the regular times it shows up in the lectionary. And it is in almost uh, all funeral sermons, very, very many of them. So I've had an awful lot of experience with this scripture. And I'll be honest, I've had a lot of discomfort and dis-ease with it. Um, every time, particularly in funeral services. I've never gotten over what seems to me to be a very painful irony of that last line in a funeral setting. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. You know, I have read those words and I have looked out at uh, groups of mourners and half expected that someone would just jump up and say, in the name of Jesus, I want my spouse, my parent, my child, my friend back again. I, um, excuse me, I lost my concentration for a second there because I got very big and it was all I could see was me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but I've looked out at these people and thought that somebody might do that, that somebody might just claim that last sentence and say, well, if it's really true, then let me just say it right now and get my life back. Because it's what we want in those situations, isn't it? Uh, we want life to go back to what it was uh, before illness or trauma or death came along. But I've never heard anyone actually do that. I've never, I've never heard anyone say that out loud. And I think it's because we don't really believe that those words will be true. Belief and disbelief in tough times. That's where this whole scripture starts, doesn't it? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. <clears throat> Believe also in me. 
Now there's something uh, tricky about prepositions that goes on in scripture like this. Uh, when we're moving from Greek to English, there's a lot of variety in how you can interpret the prepositions. Prepositions are words like in, of, at, by, from, on, to, with, you know, you, you get it, right? Um, and in English for us, there's one specific meaning behind each of those words. Each preposition is different. If I say someone is behind me, we know exactly what that means. Below, we know what that means. Beside, we know what that means. And each of those prepositions is extremely different and very specific, as is of and in, right? But in Greek, those prepositions are much more vague and they could have multiple meanings. So when Paul talks about having faith in Christ, um, and he does that in Galatians 2, and he does it again in Philippians 3, and probably other places that I don't remember. Um, but you might see a note in your Bible that would tell you that it also could be, instead of saying in Christ, have faith in Christ, have the faith of Christ. And that little preposition makes a lot of difference to us. It could mean having faith in Christ, believing who Christ is, but it could also mean having the faith of Christ, the kind of faith that Christ had. And either of those would be a correct translation of the language. Now, we can take that understanding and we can look at this reading from John and read through that lens and see that what we're reading in English might say, believe in me, but it could also say, have the belief of me, have belief like mine, or it might even just be translated as believe me without a preposition at all. I think believe me fits well in the context of the reading. If you look at the argument that's going on in these verses, and I'm gonna paraphrase a lot here, uh, Jesus basically said, believe me that I know God, that I know what God's kingdom looks like. Believe me that I'm going there and that when I get there, I'm gonna prepare a place for you to come to. And believe me that you know how to follow me and get there. And all of that would be a great comfort to their troubled hearts, right? It would allow them to have peace, to have confidence that even when he died, they would be okay. But the argument took a turn uh, when Philip and Thomas chime in, right? They've got that, that voice of practicality and that voice of disbelief. Wait a minute, and then again, I'm paraphrasing. You know, we don't know the destination and we don't know the way to the de destination. So how can we believe you? How can we untrouble our hearts, really, is what they're asking. And all Jesus had for an answer to both of them was to return to the beginning of the argument, believe me. I'm the destination, I'm the way to the destination. If you believe in me, if you have belief like mine, if you believe what I'm saying to you, then you already know all you need to know. Now, I like that Jesus didn't ignore the practical problem, the, the disbelief that was behind their questions. And he did shift the conversation a little so it'd be easier for them to understand. You know, if you can't just believe me, then believe your own eyes. Believe the things you've seen me do. Believe the evidence you've seen of my power and my reliability. And then before he could they could even have time to, to toss in some more questions, he moved the argument forward another step. He said, and then, you know, once you believe in me because you believe what you've seen me do, then you can start believing in yourself because you're gonna do the same kinds of things. You'll see yourself taking the same actions. You'll create the same kind of evidence for everyone around you to see so that others can believe as well. For the first time when I was reading this scripture these last few weeks, I realized what has bothered me all this time about this final sentence. If, you, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. And it's, it's that I've always sort of disassociated that line with the earlier part of the argument. I have held that one little sentence apart as if it is the promise of a miracle waiting to happen for me. As if I could ask for anything I want and then like rubbing a magic lamp, I'd be granted three wishes. 
I think this time I recognized what the sentence really is. It's simply the natural outcome of this argument that starts with believing Jesus and which ends with our works being like his works. But before I could really close that loop in my, in my mind and be sure that I was hearing something correct, um, I started to wonder what works we were talking about. What kind of miracles did the disciples see Jesus do? What evidence had he provided for Philip and for Thomas and for us that we can believe and can imitate? And it occurred to me that I can't remember a single time when Jesus did a miracle on his own behalf. Can you? The closest I could come as I was thinking about it was the raising of Lazarus. Did he perhaps raise Lazarus out of his own grief to alleviate his own sorrow over the loss of his friend? Or did he do it for Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, and their grief and their pain? So I went back and I read that story more closely. And you know what I saw? No, the scripture's clear. He was distressed. He was disturbed by the death. He was disturbed by the, the pain of the sisters. He weeps over that all. But he tells both sisters quite clearly why he's doing this miracle. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? His work is not done for his own benefit or even Lazarus or the sisters. It's evidence provided so that the glory of God is visible and that all who see it and all who hear about it will believe. After that, I thought about all the, the kind of tough situations that we've read about during Lent and Easter. You know, Jesus starving in the wilderness back at the beginning of Lent. Um, you know, he didn't even whisper a prayer of a request for food or drink, did he? He was challenged by religious leaders for working on the Sabbath, that first day of Holy Week. Not a hint of a prayer that his ministry would be easier. Holy Thursday is betrayed and he's denied by his followers. Good Friday is beaten and tortured. The closest he came to asking for any miracle, anything to help his own troubled soul, was a plea to God, take this cup from me. And even that plea, that prayer ends with, but not my will be done. Even hanging on the cross, his prayers, his requests, his miracle hopes, his promises for all the others around him were all for them. Forgiveness for those who were killing him forming a new relationship between his mother and the disciple he loved, promising paradise for the thief on the cross next to him. This is what his followers saw him do with their own eyes. This is the evidence they believed they'd follow and they would imitate. And that really closed the loop for me, made that last sentence the complete fulfillment of this whole scripture. Thomas and Philip and all the rest will believe Jesus that they can do the work that he would have done if he were there with them. They will pray to be able to help others in imitation of him and their prayers in his name will be answered. They will live out the miracle of giving evidence to his power by their answered prayers on behalf of others. We're uh, living in a time when we would really like a miracle, aren't we? You know, we have a long list of prayers, of hopes, of requests. In some ways, life has been, I think, a lot like living in a three-month-long funeral service, hasn't it? And we would love to be able to just stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, I want back the life I used to have. I, I want to just give a polish to the side of a lamp and, and have the whole crisis gone and be back to where we were six months ago, back before death and trauma and, and illness showed up. But that isn't what this last sentence in today's reading is telling us will happen or we should do, is it? It isn't saying just ask for anything and you'll get it. It's saying, believe what you've seen Jesus do, ask for the ability to do what he's done, and believe that you'll be able to do it. And of course you will receive that miracle. Of course those prayers will be answered. You know how to do what he did. You know what he'd do if he was here now. You know how to work for the ease of troubled hearts everywhere, how to give life, how to forgive, how to build relationships, how to find paradise right here, right now. You've got this. 
You've got this. May you be blessed this week to believe him and to imitate his works. Let us pray. Gracious God, we know that you will answer our prayers to be more like you, to live more in the image of Christ, to show your glory to the world. Thank you for showing us the destination and the way to reach it, all in the life of Jesus. Amen. the kingdom of God and God's righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Hallelujah And it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock on the door shall be opened unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. A long time ago, I learned this um, method for teaching children how to pray, and it was called the Five Finger Prayer. And I was going through some old books and uh, thinking about things to get rid of recently, and I found the book that had that in, and it reminded me about it. And I want to be using that method for our prayer time today, because even though it was a child's method, um, I think it's an important uh, structure and framework for us as adults, too. And I'll be leaving time between fingers so you can unmute yourself if there are prayers that you'd like to share. So let us join me in prayer. Oh, gracious God, we come to you with hands outstretched, asking to be filled. We come with hands folded together in prayer. We come with hands you can use to do your work in the world. And today we look at our hands to guide our prayers. We begin with our thumbs, God, the finger that makes us human, that makes us able to hold. And we pray for our family and friends, those we hold most dear to us. I particularly this morning ask for Carol and for Liz, family and friend that I lost this past week, and for my son-in-law, 
who had a negative test after a positive one. Um, prayer for silent unity. Um, they need prayer because they are struggling right now, though they pray for everyone around the world themselves. Pray for Jackie and her family. Yes. And then, gracious God, we move on to our index finger the one that points, and we pray for the people who point us to you. I particularly pray for all Sunday school teachers today. I pray for my brother Alex. Next comes our middle finger, oh God, the tallest one. And we pray for those who stand tall these days. We pray for our leaders in cities, states, and countries struggling with COVID-19. And I particularly pray for the leaders of states that are starting to open up. I'd like to offer a prayer of thanks to all of our frontline workers of every stripe, those in medical facilities and caregivers, and the people who bring your uh, groceries to your door, and all the teachers who continue to provide lessons online to the children. Next comes our ring finger, God, the weakest of all our fingers. And it reminds us to pray for all those in need. I particularly pray today for food banks and blood banks. Lift up the homeless to you, Lord, and most vulnerable. And finally, God, we come to our last finger, the littlest finger, the smallest finger, and it reminds us to pray for ourselves. I particularly pray for myself and all of you to be able to imitate Jesus every day this week. Lord, I pray that you command this virus to shrivel, shrivel up and die and go away, never to return. I pray that we all develop a strength to continue in our isolation and um, the will to help others. God grant us the wisdom to stay safe in these uh, very dangerous times and to make wise choices to continue to uh, um, avoid this horrible virus. For all these words we have said, all the thoughts in our minds, and all the joys and sorrows in our hearts, we pray that you would hear us 
and answer us. And now, gracious God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to your mercy and protection as we pray together in the way of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom comes, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us now prepare for our offering. And um, if you have not been here before, I remind you, um, let you know, remind those of you who have been here before, that if you go in the chat room, you'll find information about how to share your tithes and offerings. If you haven't been sharing electronically, I invite you to uh, actually during the offering, go set aside your money that you're going to send to the church, write out the check, do whatever it is you need to do now to help you feel that sense of gratitude that comes along with giving our tithes to God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we believe in the amazing gift of your Son, Christ our Lord, the roadmap, the secret formula, the missing piece of the puzzle in our grand plans. We share this offering with the unceasing prayer that your work will spring up and break forth in all corners of the world. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Amen. And let us join together in our closing hymn, O Jesus, I Have Promised. In the name of the creator and the redeemer and the sustainer, enter into the battle this week. Give life, forgive, strengthen relationships, and find paradise. Jesus has promised you, and you have promised to believe and to follow and to imitate him. You've got this. Amen.
Thank you, Reverend Perry. Well, you're quite welcome. Thank you for having me here. We're good. A very inspiring and um, sunny. And Diane, you were, as always, so good, so professional. Thank you. Yes. yes. Appreciate your ministry so much. Oh, and look at everybody. Nice see to together. see you all there. <laughs> to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. Oh, sure. Sure. Thank good you man. for all your help. Rob. Thank everyone for being here. Yeah. Rob Van Winkle. <laughs> Hi, Betty. Thank you. Two pages. Reverend, Reverend Beth, I love that brooch. It is the cutest thing. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, there's a story that goes with it. It belonged to a very elderly woman in my home church about maybe 35, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And she had a yard, we had a yard sale and she brought it and sold it at the yard sale. And I just loved her to death. And somehow I managed to keep that pen all these years. So I still think about her from time to time. Yeah. What's your home church? My home church right now is Judson Memorial Church. But what about growing up? Oh, growing up, it was Otterbein United Brethren Church, EUB, Evangelical United Brethren Church, when I was real little. And then I went to a um, Church of God when I was a teenager. And, and then when I um, came back to the church, it was United Methodist Churches, one in Camp Hill. And then the one that this woman was a member of was a little tiny urban church. Um, in an area called Shy Poke um, mm. in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It's uh, right close to the river, flood zone area. Mm. But, uh, but it, was, um, it was really little. It was right across the street from our house. So it was the, it was the church that finally, um, how do I want to say it? It was the church where I understood what my calling years and years and years before had actually been. And it was the church that enabled me to um, start being liturgists, you know, and to, uh, to just understand what it was like to stand in the pulpit and then gradually to become um, a lay speaker and to take on, uh, you know, leadership roles and do all sorts of things. Um, the pastor that was there when I got there said, um, I was one of her sheep who became a shepherd. <laughs> mm. Yeah. That was, nice a, you know, it doesn't matter the size of the church, the impact that you can have on somebody's life is so dramatic and, and can, uh, can then, I hope anyway, affect other people. And, you know, I say my congregation now is uh, the internet, right? I, I teach online courses. So, so my congregation spreads across the country, you know, which is kind of, kind of fun. And you all have each other when you talk about your home church. Mm. Not, not a building, but all those faces we're looking at right now. And the names on the second page, not so many faces. On, oh, well, there's more faces over there now. Yay. <laughs> you all hear the oh. church bells ringing? I, I left my microphone open just in case. Oh, no. no. I don't hear it. Yeah. Kind of, sort of. Do very good at picking up background. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, Betty. Hi, Francis. Oh, I hear them. I just opened my window. Oh, okay. Because you're closer to everybody else, I think. Oh, yeah. Loretta, I keep seeing your face, but I don't hear. I keep hearing your voice, but I don't see your face. That might be a good thing. <laughs> Are you trying that? It. Is that deliberate? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. Chest. Where's your face? Yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm, I always like try to find the person and, and then I can look at them on the screen, you know. I'm a woman of mystery. Well, I keep hearing her voice, but I... <laughs> happy Mother's Day, everybody. Yeah. Oh, I yes, forgot. Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Right, right, right. Yeah. Hi, Francis. Happy Mother's Day, Diane. Hey, I miss you. Hi, Yang. Good to Hi, see you, girl. Yeah. Oh, so Karen here. Yeah. Oh, cool. Brian, I didn't know you grew a mustache. Hi, Agnes and Penny. Hey, Jeannie. Where, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? 
Oh, uh, there's Loretta. Now I see her shirt. Yeah, <laughs> probably a shirt. The invisible me. <laughs> the Campbell teeth. Uh, hi, Ernie and Alice. Hey, Alan. How are you? <laughs> oh, lovely, Sunny. Wonderful music as always. Yeah, that really was beautiful. That laugh. So was inspiring. Gorgeous. Oh, it's Ernie and Alice. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Ernie and Alice. Hey, Karen Del Greco, if you're on. I yeah, I was coffee speaking hour. to her. Yeah. Your food at coffee hour. Yeah. Oh, her cake. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, you can still deliver it to the lounge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, Sonny. <laughs> if only we could have a video a background for the for our pictures that had a cake on it, right? No, I want the cake. Forget the background. I want the cake. <laughs> you don't like that. <laughs> Give me the food. Today is my 75th birthday. Oh, oh happy birthday, Glenda. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Glenda. Happy birthday. Hey, happy birthday. Yeah. Sunny, Sunny, let's sing. Oh, happy, birthday. happy birthday to you. Oh my God, I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Glinda. Happy birthday to you. Happy <laughs> birthday, Glinda. That's a big Happy one. Birthday. Yeah. It's a proud way for just for you. Happy birthday, sis. Aww. Is Alan going to spoil you rotten? Say again. Is Alan going to spoil you rotten? Yeah, he already does. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's a good Beverly, I heard sis. My sister Beverly, I think I heard. Oh, oh nice. Agnes. Agnes. <laughs> Aggie. There they are, the glamour queens. Uh oh. Oh my God. You have a you have a double joy today. Happy Mother's Day and happy birthday. Yeah. 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 Yes, Agnes. Happy thank Mother's you. Day too. Oh, I saw Wendy there. Hey, hey Wendy. Wendy. Did your daughter have her baby yet? <laughs> oh, they have a birthday. Happy birthday. Oh, oh, Wendy. That's sweet. Oh, <laughs> look at that bow. Gorgeous. <laughs> I come, I come to you. Oh, she's so cute. Betty, you look beautiful this morning. It's As always. You, Betty. Hi, yeah. Oh, there's Hal. Hi, Hal. How is how is Betty? Hey, Rosemary. Oh, Betty, beautiful yeah. as always. You go, Betty. I love that red lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they start looking at people's outfits. <laughs> it's new. I had to have something new. Loretta, <laughs> don't miss. I actually have shoes on. Oh yeah. <laughs> I figure that's a win. Hi. Hi, Hale. Oh, yeah. Hi. Good to see you. Hi. <laughs> Rob, you look oh, like you wow. can oh, hey. Hi, Wendy. Hi. <laughs> Those beautiful children of yours. Yeah. Yeah, Sweetheart. <laughs> Well, it's good to see all of you, and I will see you again next week. I'm going to yeah. uh, say goodbye for now, though. Thank you, <laughs> okay. Reverend Perry. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you all for having yeah. me. Yeah. See you next yes. week. Bye-bye. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.